Hemlo, and welcome to Dear Franny, the podcast where I have uncommon conversations about love with fascinating people. I'm your host, Francesca Hoogie. In today's episode, I talk to my friend, Andrea Belke. Andrea is a successful TV host, a three-time Survivor contestant, and much, much more. I know her from playing Survivor with her twice. And since we first met, Andrea has made some really big life changes, and so have I. We get into that, we get into more, and I'm really excited for you to hear this episode, especially anyone who has struggled to find their way in love and in life, and you're like, I don't know what to do, and what am I good at, and what's the path, and it's just, there's a lot of really um, practical advice that Andrea gives in this episode, and she shares so much of herself, and I'm really grateful to her for being so open, and I'm really excited for you to hear this episode. So please enjoy my conversation with Andrea Belke. For those of you who don't know Andrea Belke, where have you been? (laughs) She is... A three-time Survivor contestant, which is how we know each other from those first two times. <laughs> Didn't go so well for me. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's not talk about that. <laughs> and you are now the co-host of People Now, and you're on the red carpet every other day, interviewing the biggest stars in the world and interviewing lots of different people in the studio. And I mean, I'm so proud of you. This is amazing, this career you have now. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think it's really crazy that my life's kind of taken this route because I went to school for acting and then I somehow randomly did three seasons of Survivor and then (laughs) I got this people job, then switched more to hosting. So right now, life's good. I just turned 30. I know. Happy birthday. I saw your birthday trip to Ireland looked amazing. Yeah, it was great. Dublin is totally my jam, but I don't know. It feels good at 30 because I mean I first met you when I was 21 it feels good now it's crazy someone sent me a video of Redemption Island go I'm watching Redemption Island and I was like no (laughs) don't please don't god don't wow it's been nine years yeah it's pretty nuts but I'm really happy with where everything is right now in my life feel like an adult Yeah. Well, you have a very glamorous looking job. (laughs) What actually is glamorous about your job and what isn't at all? Well, okay. It's a lot of expectation versus reality. And also everything looks way better on social media. Example, I posted a picture from the Rocketman premiere and I got to interview Taryn Edgerton who plays Elton John. I got to interview all these stars. But the reality is you are in a line of reporters down the carpet. You are (laughs) struggling to get them to stop by you. You get one question sometimes. Yeah. It can be kind of soul sucking. Mm. I recently did a carpet and Shirley Theron and Seth Rogen, it was okay. a long shot. I was so far down the carpet. And by the time they got to me, they, I got one question. I was paired with another outlet and I asked the question. Charlize looked at me and said, uh, I'm not going to answer that in a oh. joking, fun way. Okay. But basically I came back to my boss with nothing and mm. I, cried. <laughs> I cried. Oh, Charlize <laughs> Theron made you cry. <laughs> you get all dressed up and you're just crammed with a bunch of reporters it yeah. always looks so much better on Sophia <laughs> however and also what I, was the question was it something personal no it was something related to the movie it was something about a bad date or bad pickup line or something she easily could have answered it that's yeah. the thing yeah. but I kind of get it I mean if you're a star as big as Charlie Theron and you've done press so many rounds of press for this movie so you're just over it I, it just kind of sucked because I've always looked up to her sometimes it's like don't meet your idol you yeah know? I was gonna say when Whenever you meet your heroes, you always risk being disappointed. Well, who's been the best surprise, celebrity-wise? Oh, well, I loved interviewing Donald Glover. He was so, so nice. And at the same, that was for Han Solo, so also Amelia Clark. I don't know if you're a Game of Thrones fan. Yes, I am. Oh, I was. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Last season. Oh, my God. Tragic. Yeah, that was such a shame. Yeah, I know. I finally caught up right before this last season, so I was so excited to watch with everybody. Let down completely. (laughs) But I love Amelia Clark and Donald Glover. That was at the same carpet. And the nicest celebrity ever, it's always The Rock. He He, seems like just the most wonderful person. He somehow remembers my name. He always stops at the carpet. Yeah, he's... 
he's the best. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so being around like all of these super glamorous, super famous people, like how is this affecting like your view on love or relationships? And you see them and you see them in their, you know, perfect looking couples. And you talked about social media and, you know, how all that, you see so much the contrast between that glamorous front and the reality that must be affecting your worldview, right? Yeah, I guess. I, I don't know if I've always had a pessimistic view on love. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that being around celebrities in Hollywood really helps to change that. Because especially in Hollywood, everyone gets divorced and there's so many cheating scandals and we cover all this at length. Yeah, I think it probably definitely makes me less trusting that it already was. Oh, that's not good. Yeah, but in the media, that's all you hear about. I mean, there are some yeah. relationships that stick together, but yeah, I don't know. I've also had, I've had married actors hit on me and that kind of- Imagine. There's also a thing about actors and musicians and people that are traveling a lot is there's just a lot of opportunities to cheat. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm a pessimist when it comes to- <laughs> So what's going on in your love life? My love life, it's pretty tragic, Fran. I oh no. <laughs> so I don't know, like, I know you always try to help me break these patterns, but I guess recently, so I quit my dating apps because mm -hmm. I want to find someone in real life and I'm inspired by you because you met your, uh, current, you're still dating yes, him, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, you met your boyfriend on the street. Yeah, on the street corner. Yep, yep. <laughs> uh, so I finally just deleted the apps because I was having just kind of a string of bad luck with them. Right now I'm just in a phase where I'm never interested in anybody and they're suitors. They're suitors that I'm hit sure. They're so nice. They're perfect on paper. I just don't feel that connection. And then when I finally do like somebody, I get crazy. Like there's like a, like a flip switches and all of a sudden I go from a sane, well-adjusted individual to a psycho. Yeah. And I like obsess over them and I build them up in my mind. Mm -hmm. And then it, you know, if they don't text back, I freak out and I just become almost a different person. Yeah. So I'm trying to find that middle ground. Do you have any ability to talk yourself down in those situations? Because like we have knee jerk reactions to things, conditioned, you know, behaviors, but sometimes you see yourself doing something, you see yourself reacting in a certain way. I call it calling bullshit on myself. Like sometimes yeah. it's like, I see what I'm about to do or what I'm about to say. And I'm like, ah, oh, fuck it. Ugh, I can't say that. Like, just don't do it. Like I have to just tell myself, stop. You're being crazy right now. Yeah. I mean, I can do that. I'm usually very aware of anything. I've always been pretty self-aware and I know when I'm being kind of crazy, mm -hmm. but then I still want to be as honest as I can. So the last guy I dated who was just not a right fit, but he's a wonderful guy and that ended in the spring. I eventually found myself not texting back for a few hours because he took longer to text or mm -hmm. not really saying how I felt. And eventually it's just like pipe burst. And I just had to say, Hey, this is how I feel. I don't even know if we're really the right fit by simultaneously. I'm questioning if we are connecting, but also I am really invested and like you. So what should we do? And then he kind of felt the same way and we ended it. And then there's a part of me that kicks myself because I'm like, ah, we could have stuck it out longer. And I really liked him. And then I had to kind of mourn that relationship. I mean, it was kind of a fling. It was only for a few months, but, so that's did, kind of did, but you liked him. So he must have liked you too. Like what, why did it end? Yeah. I mean, he told me that he liked me too. I just think that when we were together, I didn't feel like myself and I felt like we had nothing to talk about. And I'm a very talkative person. Imagine this, we're hanging out, walking around Prospect Park and I had nothing to talk about. Really? <laughs> yeah, that was the last day I saw him. And I was so frustrated because everything else was great and physically mm. was great. Yeah. And How did you meet him? I met him, we used to like work together a long time ago. Oh, okay. And then that's how I usually meet people. It's like we, we knew each other way back when. Mm -hmm. Someone had a girlfriend, someone had a boyfriend, and then all of a sudden we come back together years later or through friends. Okay, okay. So that sounds like, I mean, you need to enjoy each other's company. I mean, if you can't talk, then... <laughs> Yeah, it was weird. Sometimes yeah, I'm just not nice. myself with people. Mm -hmm. or I'm, I, I feel like I need to impress them. Yeah. We all know those relationships where you meet somebody and you feel like you can be completely yourself mm -hmm. and say whatever comes to mind. You can be weird, you can be silly and not judge it. But with him, I just felt almost uptight or trying to be a different version of myself. Yeah. So I kind of was realizing that I was getting way too invested in him while knowing we maybe weren't a match. Mm -hmm. So I kind of had a 
had ended because otherwise I get so invested and it hurts. Like I feel things so strongly. And every time one of these little flings end, it just seems like in the last year, I've had all these little two, three month things. It just takes a solid month to kind of get over it. Mm-hmm. And it sucks, but I guess yeah. that's the process is you have mm-hmm. to grieve all those little relationships. And it's a good thing I feel and I'm not sociopath. <laughs> it yeah. sucks. I mean, it takes time to grieve, but it's also like, there's a point at which you got to say, okay, I'm tired of this pattern. Yeah. I think like it actually, sometimes instead of getting actually frustrated or like hurt by a pattern, you kind of just have to get bored of it. You know, kind of just like, oh, I know exactly how this is going to end. This isn't interesting to me anymore. But I would say that maybe a challenge for you is next time that you are, because you do have the self-awareness, next time you're in a situation with anyone where you feel like you're not being yourself, you feel like you're starting to be that version that you think they want, just challenge yourself to say or do something that's so authentically you. Uh, Do you think when I'm starting to feel that way, that I should just say, hey, I'm going to be straightforward. I like you. I want to explore this. I don't always feel myself with you. So I want to figure out why we're not clicking. Or, I mean, I don't, also don't want to freak a guy out. I feel like yeah. in the beginning, you just want to be fun. Well, this is your journey. This is like for you to start to get more comfortable in your own skin and being yourself and showing up as yourself. I mean, I think to say something to someone like, just so you know, I like you. I'm working on being better at expressing that. <laughs> like that's one thing. But I don't, I wouldn't, but it's still like about you and the journey that you have to go on. Yeah. And, you know what I mean? Like a comfort level that you need to develop. Does that make sense? It does. I think it's hard. I mean, cause I talk about dating with my friends all the time and I'm sure it's similar in LA, but especially New York cause that's where I live. Mm-hmm. It's just so hard for people to say how they really feel. Telling someone that you like them is <laughs> almost a death curse for <laughs> because I don't know. It seems like everyone's just kind of keeping options open and looking for the next best thing. I've been totally ghosted before Mm -hmm. after a month of dating somebody. So I think I'm way more guarded than I used to be because I don't want to come on too strong or express my feelings because then I feel like they're going to fade me out because it's happened before. So then it's this pattern. I'm not saying how I feel. And it's not good. Andrea, don't you think the bigger issue is that you are attracted to the guys who are a challenge and not the guys who are actually available? I know. (laughs) No, that is the bigger issue. But how do I, I can't force myself to be attracted to those guys. You can't force yourself to be attracted to them, but you can force yourself to start to ask, okay, what am I protecting myself from here? Because you are protecting yourself, right? You are staying like, quote unquote, safe from intimacy, because it's only ever going to go but so far with these guys that you're attracted to. So you think that's why I'm attracted to the guys that don't like me? (laughs) Yeah, I do. Yes, I do. It's basically like we get these beliefs that become ingrained in us like in childhood before we even know what we're agreeing to, like what we're sentencing ourselves to basically. Whatever we decide, whatever that decision is, we equate that with safety. Even if it's not safe, even if it comes from a painful place, even if it's, oh, I think that if I love people, they're going to leave me, right? Then being in a dynamic where you're getting left over and over again feels safe because it feels familiar, not because it feels good, right? So it's confusing to use the word safe because it's like, this does not feel safe. This feels like shit, right? (laughs) No, but it's actually comfortable. So when you kind of start to understand that, you're like, oh, I'm choosing something based on trauma or some wound that I may not even understand because we're not always going to understand where everything came from. And it's Mm -hmm. not even important to understand where. It's just like, well, it is. I don't know why it happened. (laughs) I don't know where it came from, but somewhere along the line, like this is what I decided love looks like. And so when you know that about yourself, then you can start to say like, all right, hmm, well, maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe actually it is safe for me to just be vulnerable with somebody who's not going anywhere. And just, it's a process of like pushing yourself, you know, a little bit more and a little bit more into that discomfort. But the more awareness you bring to the situation, the more that it starts to shift. Yeah, but you can't really force yourself to be sexually attracted to somebody. No, you can't. But once your belief about yourself starts to change, then who you're attracted to also starts to change. Oh. Yeah. That's the big piece (laughs) that is hard to imagine right now. But there'll come a point as you go through this process, look, you'll meet a guy to be like, oh my God, there's a time I would have been all over this. (laughs) Yeah. I'm just not into it anymore. I think I've come a a long way in terms of like, I know the red flags that I've learned from past relationships. That's so funny. I'm no longer into the pretty boys with all the red flags. You know? <laughs> like I know the fuckboy boy types. Yeah. I don't know how to say that. You can word. say whatever you okay. want. <laughs> like now, 
now I know those red flags. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm getting better. Yeah, I stay away from like the super hotties. That <laughs> you can tell are bad though. You know, like some hot guys are good news. <laughs> yeah, you could be hot and a good guy, but <laughs> you know the ones. Yeah, so I stay away from those now. Yeah. So in general, like, you know, you spoke about like married actors hitting on you and things like that. But what is it like for you being in the public eye and being single and dating? Like, what's that like? Like, it's hard enough if you're just an, a random anonymous person versus if somebody can go on Instagram and see, you know, your tens of thousands of followers and form opinions about you based on that. Yeah, that's why I try to find a sweet spot of a guy that has a lot going on that maybe understands the TV and film world. So he thinks I I'm cool, but not because I was on Survivor or not because of my job. Yeah. He's interested, but he's not looking up to me like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you get to do that in a way that's like fanboyish, mm-hmm. you know? Why do fans not understand that people don't want to date groupies? And look, I love Survivor fans. But you know what I mean? Like the Survivor fan who thinks that by telling you how much he loves you, how he's loved you since Redemption Island and you're his favorite and you're his dream girl. Like the guy who thinks that that is going to give him a chance with you? How does he not know that that's not going to work? It's funny because there was a guy I was talking to somewhat recently that I was into and- Was he a fan? (laughs) Yeah. Oh my God. You just gave every fan, every- Andrea like, fanboy, all the hope in the world. Super fan, Fran. A super fan. Oh my god. <laughs> I've never dated a fan before, but <laughs> wow. Okay, but but he would say things like, "Wow, so you're like insta famous," and I was like, "No, you can't say stuff like that." Or he would call me. He would call me a celebrity, and I was like, "No, absolutely, no, 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 no. You can't say stuff like that because I don't view myself like that. I'm still just I don't know a regular person with my own struggles, trying to make it in this world. Right. And like you know, we were on Survivor. We're not that cool. We're really not. (laughs) Yeah, so I guess I try not to date people that treat me like I'm on a pedestal because then honestly, I get a little insecure that they have me on that pedestal and they like me because I was on TV or because Mm -hmm. of my job. And then I worry that, I don't know, as soon as the facade comes down, then all of a sudden they're like, oh, I don't really like Andrea. Like I want someone to like me for me and Mm -hmm. Survivor and people and everything is just a side note. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, I 100% understand. Well, and that being put on a pedestal thing, like, I don't think this is, this is kind of getting back to what I was saying about not literal fanboys, though, that is something that you have to deal with. But like, just in general, whenever people meet somebody and they're like, oh my God, this person is like every single thing I'm looking for. And you're doing it in a way that you're looking up to them and you're putting them on that pedestal. I'm like, nobody wants to be on a pedestal because you're not going to stay there for long. You can't live on a pedestal where true intimacy lies, you know? Yeah, because I do fear they don't know me as a person. Yeah. It's yeah. just this idea. They're projecting. Yeah. It's this idea. And that actually, that's why I went off of dating apps because I was on dating apps and I was doing the thing and it's so bad. And I should have been off a long time ago because I was matching with people and maybe I would respond once and then I would just, eh. I don't feel like it. And just mm-hmm. stop responding. Mm-hmm. And then I had somebody, their opening line was a survivor joke. Mm. So I, I did respond saying, ha ha, never heard that one before. And yeah. then they responded again. And then I never responded just because life happens. Yeah. And I just yeah. don't feel like online dating. And he blew it with a survivor joke anyway. Well, and he blew it with a survivor joke. Don't <laughs> do a survivor joke to people if you see them on <laughs> or whatever. And then, but then a couple of days later, he said something like, oh, wow, I used to think you were really cool. And now I see how you are just ghosting. And I was like, oh my gosh. So oh, then God. I realized like, I got to get off of dating apps because I'm not actually, I'm not actually going to meet up with these people anyway. And Mm -hmm. I don't want people thinking I'm a bad person just because I'm not responding, you know? Yeah. To anybody who says that to you, I see how you are. I'm like, you're really, I see how you are. (laughs) Like you dodged a bullet there. Like, why would that be your response? out. So entitled, Um, right? Like you've nothing better to do. I've dated guys though that hated that I was on Survivor. Mm-hmm. Hated it. Probably That's brought not good up, either. Brought out their insecurities. Yeah, uh, yeah I had that same situation. Honestly, Survivor ended two of my relationships. It ended because, one of mine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a real thing. I mean, I mm-hmm. I bet if you talk to a lot of people that have played Survivor, they'd have similar experiences. Sometimes yeah. they can't handle it. Mm-hmm. There's so many there's so many different ways that they can't handle it. Either the attention, they can't relate to you anymore. So I, I want to yeah. find that sweet spot of someone that's like, that's really cool that you did it. Mm-hmm. Maybe has a few questions, maybe would watch it, but yeah. isn't super, super fan. 
Yeah, I, I totally agree. My boyfriend um, has never watched Survivor. Did you? you don't, yeah, and you don't want him to. No, I mean, I'm like, I'm like, I haven't watched it either. Like, this is great. Like, no need to watch it. No one no, has to watch it. Actually, my my best friends have not watched my seasons, and I'm like, yeah. that's fine. That's it's totally fine, fine, right? Yeah, I know. I, I think people are always apologizing. They're like, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, I haven't seen it, and I'm like, why are you apologizing to me? Don't yeah. see it. There's no. It's not. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. But but I would like if they think it's if yeah. They hear about it it's part of who you are and it does yeah. say something about you like you know your boldness and your willingness to, to put yourself out there and be competitive and like it, those are good things like they should appreciate that about you that sense of adventure yeah oh i will tell you this story so this is a story of someone i met out in the real world that okay. was interested in the fact that i was on survivor but it's a funny way that i met him so this was recent this is the last guy i probably dated and we went on a couple okay. dates so i went to the dermatologist your skin and- looks amazing by the way you're thank you truly glowing <laughs> and have you done a dermatologist consultation before no oh well, so, maybe like a really long time ago okay yeah. i didn't know that when you go to a consultation i guess for some dermatologists you get completely naked and you wear oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah, no, I did not do that. But I guess because they're just checking your whole body for- They're checking your whole body. Well, I didn't know that this was a thing. So, okay. So I go to the dermatologist (laughs) and the the assistant, the medical practitioner comes out to get me and he's the hottest guy I've ever seen. (laughs) (laughs) I was looking around like, is this a joke? Am I I being punked right now? This is not real. And so he was so hot and called me in. I'm sitting there like, oh my gosh. So I walk into the room and then the dermatologist tells me I have to take my clothes off and put the cloth thing on. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the examination gown, the no, whatever. Gown, a gown. gown. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I do that and I am just full on sweating and also didn't know this was happening. So I was, I don't know, I was wearing a thong. Like I was just so uncomfortable. In the room, it's the dermatologist and then this hottie. And so <laughs> the dermatologist is a full exam and I didn't know this was a thing. It was super invasive. I wonder if this is a thing. I think it is. Other people have told me it's a thing, but the way that he like looked at my nipples and vagina, like it was so weird, the entire thing. It was a full body exam. I mean, were you I going went, because you had like any spots or freckles or something oh, you were worried about? I was going for melasma, which is hyperpigmentation on my face that I actually got from Survivor. Really? Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> no, it was really bad. If you watch my third season, because I think I forgot to put a lot of sunblock on, my, my whole face, it's really dark in the, like up on the crown and then under my eyes and then my upper lip. So it looks like I have a mustache. Oh which my is great. God. <laughs> <laughs> love it. I had so many. I actually had a lot of people reach out to me in my DM saying, oh, you have melasma. I have it too. I see it from the mustache. And I was like, okay. Great. <laughs> really great. Well, you're um, still so perfect now. Okay. So I went in for the melasma okay. and I'm in the room getting this full body exam, completely sweating, like sweating through the gown because I'm like so uncomfortable because I didn't know this was a thing. Also, the hottest guy I've ever seen is right there taking notes on the laptop, trying yeah. not to look. Like I don't, he was being respectful. But then the dermatologist left and then this guy, Ben, and I just striked up a conversation and we had really good chemistry and <laughs> he's very interested about Survivor but in like a cool way. Not Wait, did he like, recognize you? Did he? Oh you were talking no. about it because that's what you yeah. were talking about how it happened. Yeah exactly. Right. Okay got it. And <laughs> it, it was it was great and I was and I was just like oh my gosh this is amazing but I wasn't gonna I don't know. I'm like, I can't leave my number because it's just weird. So I'll just, next time I'm here, which will probably be in a month or so, maybe then I will. And so then I, I left and I was halfway down the block and it's him. He's like, Hey, I just uh, wanted to give you my number. If you want to call me sometime. And it was his number on a post-it. Oh yeah, I thought it was so cute. That is- so that was just a fun way that I met someone recently. Okay. You know, it's interesting though. I had once a dental hygienist asked me out on a date and it was so unwelcome. I was so upset because I was like, I don't want to have to deal with this now. Like I don't have, so I actually went out with him because I was so uncomfortable. This was years ago when I was young and didn't know how to say no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this would not happen now, but this was a long time ago. And I just remember feeling like, first of all, he asked me while I was in the chair. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Do it. I felt like such a captive audience. And he was like, well, first he, he was like asking me like where my office was and how close I was and kind of like where I li- like. So he was just asking like conversational kind of questions like, oh, like what part of town do you live in? Oh, how close is your office? Whatever. And my office at the time actually was like three blocks from my dentist's office. So he's like, oh, we should get together sometime. And I'm like, oh, 
Uh, okay. Like, I didn't know what to say. I'm like, I don't want to get together with this guy, but I didn't know what to say. And then he was like, oh, how about Friday, you know, suggested like a specific plan, like an after work plan. And I was okay. I just, I don't know. Like I just, I was so caught off guard and I felt like even if I did say no, he seemed like he was just going to be like, well, how about that? You know, I was, so I almost was like, maybe just easier to say yes. (laughs) No, I know. And then when we went out, then he fully was like, hitting on me. And then I had to say to him, I was said, I just want to, this is not a love connection. Just- well, that's so inappropriate. I mean, I, I guess it's a fine line. I was dropping hints. Yeah. And I I'm feel sure like- you were. You were. <laughs> I mean, I know what I'm doing. You were like, putting it out there. <laughs> I, look, I'm really good at like the look back and I, I'll do like a double look back and that's uh, usually enough for them to know like, okay. You should teach that to all of your friends because every I- woman who tells me that she never meets a man like in real life, I'm like, you got to work on the eye contact, honey. You have to work on the eye contact. And the key is to let your eyes linger a little too long and yes, so that they exactly. know. Or to catch them looking at you when they don't have to be. That's a good sign. And I, this, this is so bad, but my, actually my boss, we laugh about it because I date a lot of the guys that come onto our show. <laughs> um, the way that I see if they're interested is if they're looking at me when Jeremy, my co-host, is asking a question, and there's no reason for them to be looking at me, but sometimes if their eyes start back to me and they linger a little too long, I'm like, oh, they might be very friendly, very professional. But then when they leave, I always say, hey, it's really nice to meet you. And then I walk my way and I always look back. And if they look back, then I know that they're probably going to slide into my DMs. (laughs) (laughs) And if they don't look back, then I'm like, oh, well doesn't matter. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Maybe we shouldn't be hitting on people that I work, that come into my Well, job. if you were like a psychiatrist, that would be bad. Yes. <laughs> or a dentist. Maybe you should. Or a dentist. a dentist. That would be bad. You know, you're a TV host, so. It works. It works. Yeah, I, actually, honestly, I know what's appropriate and what's not. And my boss, they'll get a kick out of it. And honestly, sometimes it'll be like, I get them the scoop. <laughs> like, what's going on? <laughs> So is dating a celebrity, is that like at this point almost an ideal scenario for you? Oh, for me dating a celebrity? Yeah. Uh, actually not. I think I, I kind of now, because I've dated celebrities, so I kind of lean more towards someone that's not at all. Mm-hmm. Maybe somebody that's mm, a producer or in, in, the business. in that business. That's probably ideal for me just because I've dated a few actors and It's hard. There are some great, great actors out there, but it's, you know, if you have two people that are in the business and always wondering when the next job is going to come, like right now I have stability, but my job could end whenever because of, for whatever reason, that's how it is. And then there'll be a time where I'm back auditioning and that's a time where you're really vulnerable Mm -hmm. and you get kind of insecure. So if you're with someone who's also like on the job hunts, that can be tricky. And I mean, I'm pretty confident I can deal with fans liking the guy I'm dating and coming Mm -hmm. up to them. Cause that's happened in the past where I dated an actor and even on Valentine's day, fans were coming up to him in the middle (laughs) of our dinner. Yeah. And that was fine. So I can deal with that aspect of it. Yeah. It's more of like the dynamic between the two of you that you worry. I think, I guess it's kind of a situation. Like I have a friend who's a matchmaker who always says like in a relationship, one person needs to be the gardener and one person needs to be the flower you can't have two flowers because <laughs> like, no, there's nobody there to like tend to the soil. So you're just going to like wilt and die. <laughs> okay. So I would see, I could see how like in a two performer situation, though, obviously it works out sometimes, but it even, I think the dynamic within the relationship, even if you're a performer, like one of you needs to be the gardener. You well, need because, a gardener because you are yeah. definitely a flower. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I say that as a fellow flower. <laughs> well, that's definitely true. So yeah, if you have two flowers, it's not going to work out. Yeah. That's an interesting, I like that. I like yeah. that. That makes a lot of sense to me. And yeah. I date a lot of flowers. So I think that's why now in the last year or so, I'm trying to get away from that and maybe find someone that's a little more grounded with work and everything. Mm-hmm. And I like, I don't know. I mean, I like attention. So if I, if I date someone that also likes attention as much as I do, I think that's going to be a disaster. Yeah, that's not going to work. <laughs> gardener, you need... Okay, gardener. gardener. Okay. Like, seek out like an actual gardener, just for like a completely different... Okay, so you just turned 30. You're so originally from Wisconsin, Random Lake, Wisconsin, right? Yeah, that's your hometown, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. Nice I just, that's like in my brain. I don't, I'll just like <laughs> never forget that. I didn't look that up or anything. <laughs> I just it's remember that. It's actually amazing that you remember... 
<laughs> I think it's like a cool name. Yeah. So like, are your friends from back home, is everybody married with 10 year olds right now? Or is no one married? What's the difference now between your friends in Wisconsin versus your friends in New York? It's pretty different. So a lot of my friends back home are married with kids, like mm-hmm. absolutely across the board. And my cousins that are my age and younger are getting married. I feel like my sister is going to probably get engaged soon. It, but I don't get the pressure. I'm so thankful that my parents don't pressure me. I mean, I'm 30. By the time when they were 30, they had, ooh, I think almost, I think they had three kids by the time. Wow. They were 30. Wow. Yeah. Can you imagine? No, I can't. I honestly can't. <laughs> I am lucky that I can keep these plants alive over here in the corner. Honestly. <laughs> I can't even have a dog. I can't. I want a dog, but I can't. No, I can't imagine. And I mean, maybe someday, but just right now, I guess I'm so career focused and fun focused. (laughs) (laughs) I know you can have fun as a mom, but I just am still having a blast. Yeah. Do you want a committed, if you could meet your forever, okay, you know, I say forever partner, assuming that's something that you want and all of that. Would you want that to start tomorrow? Are you still in your fun zone? That's, (laughs) So interesting because I ask that question to people. I ask that question to people. Is that something that you've asked me before? Is that where why I, I ask maybe. people? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you think it's your own idea. And then I, <laughs> I maybe got that from you and then I think it's my idea. But I ask that to people. <laughs> I got it from you when you were on my podcast back in the day. So to answer your question, I actually think no. I think that I want a couple more years to date around. I, I'm not opposed to a serious relationship. I do love being in a relationship, mm-hmm. but I don't think I'm ready quite yet. I think maybe in two or three more years, that would be the sweet spot for me. I finally meet the person and then I'm like 33 and all right, I'm at an age where now I can start looking at the next steps and maybe then I'd be ready. But right now, I just don't feel ready to settle down. Again, I, I would totally be down for a relationship. Recently, I've actually been longing for a relationship and that's not usually how I feel, mm-hmm. but I've just been having such a great time in my career and I'm like doing all these fun things and traveling and I finally at 30 I have great financial stability I have great mental stability I feel like I'm having a lot more fun than I did even in my early 20s because I don't have anxiety I don't know I've just been having a good time and I'm like oh it'd be really fun to share this with somebody because this is probably the best version of myself I've encountered thus far in my life it's only gonna get better Really? Yes. Does it keep getting better and better? Yes, it keeps getting better and better. I'm just worried that it's going to get better and better. And then all of a sudden, like, I'm going to have a mental breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> no. You're going to be fine. It's just going to get better and better. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I mean, maybe your body is going to start betraying you a little bit, but it's okay because where you'll be mentally and emotionally, it, it'll be fine. You'll be like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing when you finally feel stable or at least you understand yourself or why you do certain things. I'm kind of a moody person, but finally at 30, I can kind of figure out, okay, I'm being this way because of this and I can get out of this in this way. And it's not just like all over the place, like not knowing how to explain to somebody that maybe I'm dating, like what the hell is going on? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have a question for you. And this is a question that I always get asked and I'm always like, oh my God, people have to stop asking me this question. But (laughs) this is more valid, I promise, coming from me to you. So Survivor, you played three times. Are you done? I love that you're asking a Survivor question. again (laughs) you know what I am open to it I just feel that I don't know I don't leave anything to lose like I'm not some survivor winner or I don't consider myself some legend so if CBS really wants to have me back every I I would do it just because I you know you always have a chance of winning you make money Mm -hmm. every time I played survivor I've made lifelong friends like I have a lot of great friends and experiences from the show so I say why not that's would you no. <laughs> no. Okay, no. but Fran, you're no. a legend in your own right and you well, know it. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. But I also, you know, I, I got a call recently, like in December or something from casting, which is always mm-hmm. funny to me because I'm like, you were really calling me still? Like, that's yeah. hilarious. Stop, stop. <laughs> really stop. I kind of like got that line. Well, you know, you're a legend in your own right. And this could be your chance. You're never getting me with that line again. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> it's fine. I don't think I have it in me to win Survivor. I don't think it's a thing that it's extremely unlikely to happen. I mean, but do you look at Survivor and if you could 
do it over, would mm-hmm. you do Survivor? I would do everything over. You yes. would, okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because I'm sure, like, you look at your life and what happened being voted out first twice was terrible. However, probably <laughs> yeah, a lot Yeah, thanks of- a lot, Andrea. <laughs> <laughs> people who are responsible just, for that. <laughs> I don't know who you're talking about. I was just trying to help you be a legend in your own right. <laughs> okay, for listeners, Fran and I have worked through this. So we, we totally it. worked through this. We can laugh about it. <laughs> but you probably, yeah, you probably had amazing opportunities from it and are grateful for it. Yeah. I mean, I think like you, I made, you know, amazing friends and people that there's just no way we ever would have met each other. Like there's just, so I'm, I'm super grateful for that. And I think for me, like actually, because it went so badly, I think it actually wound up being a, a good thing for me in that it kind of helped me to see like, oh, okay, like you're resilient. You can bounce back. You can deal with failure. You can rewrite your own narrative. You know what I mean? So I think like yeah. it was, I got a lot of lessons out of it and who knows how else I would have learned those le- those exact lessons, you know, if yeah. not for Survivor. So yeah. Was Survivor the impetus for the career change that you had? Yeah, it was. So yeah. that's amazing. Yeah, I know. It's huge. Yeah. Because after my second season, I came back and I went back to the same job and I was like, this, this can't, I can't, like something's got to change here. (laughs) You know, like this can't just be a total repeat of the first time I did this. Yeah. So I was like, it's time for me. Cause I knew that I wanted, I knew that I wanted to leave the law. I knew I wanted to do something else, but I didn't know what, but after my second season and you know, when I was at Ponderosa, which is where we go after we are out of the game. And I, Dr. Liza, actually, who mm-hmm. for those who are listening, Dr. Liza is our survivor psychologist. And, you know, I was like talking to Dr. Liza and she was like, well, where do you see yourself in five years? And I was like, oh God, I don't know, you know, and I, and she's like, well, let's talk about it. And she totally like pushed me to like paint this picture. And one of the things was like, I want to be self-employed. I want to have my own business. I want to be supporting myself. And I was like, I don't know what that is. And she's like, okay, great. You got some work to do. Like figure out what that is. That really was a huge, huge catalyst for me. So yeah, I'm grateful. Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, that is something that Survivor will do. Like because of Survivor, I ended up moving to New York earlier. I was going to stay in school and double major. I was probably going to stay with that boyfriend who hated Survivor. It was a whole thing, but Survivor kind of pushed me to just take a risk. Now I think I'm a lot more spontaneous and t- I take a lot of risks because of Survivor. It's like, if you can do Survivor, go on that crazy adventure, right. do anything really. It's true. And in your underwear, in high def, yeah. on television. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After that, you can survive anything. And actually, also being without makeup on national TV, oh, it makes yeah. you a lot more confident. Because now, when I when I date people, especially if they've watched Survivor, or now that I'm dating fanboys, apparently, <laughs> they, <laughs> they know what I look like without makeup. So anything else is just a plus. Yes, it's true. It's definitely true. It's definitely true. Yeah, <laughs> you look great on the show. You're Survivor hot, so. Thank you. Yes, you don't have to worry. I am yeah. not, which is fine. No, I'm not. It's fine. No, it's totally fine. You know how many people I've met and they've been like, oh, you're pretty. Like they're so surprised. I'm like, I don't, I don't know what's better because I've had a lot of people say, oh, you, you looks better on the Island or not to my face, but I'll read that a lot. Yeah. Like, ah, she looked better on the Island. I'm like, well, okay. What can I do with that? (laughs) You can't. I can't do anything with that. Yeah, exactly. You got a lot of, (laughs) just leave it right there. But people love, people love to say that. I was like, those girls look so much better on the island. It's like, also, I don't think that's a good thing because you're also starving. Yeah, exactly. It's you just like tan. emaciated yeah. in, in bikinis. That's yeah. All, <laughs> it's all you're saying about yourself. Exactly. I'm like, is it because I'm wearing clothes now? Okay, got it. Oh my gosh. So, okay, one last question for you. <laughs> Might be kind of a big question, but maybe not. But maybe you don't even have an answer for this question yet. But what's the dream right now? Oh man. Things are going so well, but like, what's, what's the dream? Yeah, that's a really good question. Okay. So I've never really been someone that has a five-year plan, 10 year or where I see myself just because I didn't know four years ago that I was going to be even doing hosting. Really? Like four, because I got the people job four years ago at the same time I got this little travel series that I did. And before that, I was still kind of looking at acting. I was looking at acting and hosting and also maybe moving to LA or maybe moving home to Wisconsin. I was kind of spiraling. Mm -hmm. And so then I never could have predicted where I'm at now. And I really love my job. But five years from now... um, Oh, you said you said what the dream was. Yeah, what's the dream? Well, I'm glad I discovered hosting because I really love it. Yeah. And, and you're really good at it. Yeah. I mean, I'm good at it. I've never <laughs> yeah. felt confident in something until I found hosting. Oh, but that's it, amazing. 
Yeah, even with acting, I went to school for acting. With the, even with a BFA in acting, I still sometimes was like, I don't even know if I'm good. Like, mm-hmm. I don't, but audition, I would do projects and look back and be like, I guess I, I felt like I was in the moment, but I have no idea if that was good or not. Mm-hmm. With hosting, I, I feel really confident. And it's all subjective. Sometimes people won't like you as a host because they it's different personalities, but I know I can go in and do a good job. So I'm so happy that I found that. Also with my job, I've learned how to produce. So I'm now having a producer background as well. So awesome. I would say the dream is to kind of stay in on this track in some way. And mm-hmm. I like not having a specific, like, of course, I'd love to host my own travel show. Everyone would. That's a dream. Uh, or a morning show. I mean, I kind of already do a morning show, but like a, on a bigger scale. And that's mm-hmm. always a dream too. But I think just the goal is to like stay on this track, producing, hosting, maybe have my own production company someday. And also just be happy. That's a huge thing now too. I thought of leaving my job to travel or maybe like, try to climb the ladder even more. Mm -hmm. But then I realized if I'm happy and having a good time, I want to just kind of live in this for a bit. That's amazing. When we talk about this in the future, be like, yeah, you did exactly that. And again, you're catching me on a day where I feel really good and I'm in a good mood. get it twisted. If you caught me on a different day, I would be spiraling. I hate my life and I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I do want to point that out for anyone listening is yeah, right now I feel really good. I had someone reach out to me yesterday and they wanted to grab a coffee and they just messaged me and said, you know, it just seems like you have your life together and everything's so amazing. And I just feel like I'm struggling and I, I just love to pick your brain on how you got there. And I just thought, yeah, I guess it looks like that on social media all the time. And sure, most of the time now, or at least 70, 30, I am feeling good. But there's also those days where I feel really low and I'm confused and I'm depressed. And I'm just always trying to like fight to stay above, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm really glad that you said that. Like, thank you for saying that. I mean, and it's it's good for people to hear that and like really understand. And I totally second that, you know, there are days where I wake up with my heart just feels so full of gratitude and love. And I'm just like, man, like I really done, like I really made amazing life choices. Like this is so fantastic. (laughs) And then other days I wake up and I'm like, why have I done this to myself? Like what, like, how am I going to do this? Like what, you know, why have I put myself in this position? Like this is so stressful. All, you know, all the things I think that for me, And I'd be curious, like kind of how you navigate that. But for me, it's really important that I have practices that I do that take the time to keep myself like in an okay, stable, happy mental state, then like my life falls apart. (laughs) And even if it's just like I go for a walk so I can like think and clear my head every day, if that's like all I get to do for myself, like I do that, like I need something, you know? Yeah, no, I agree. I've, I've learned that I have to be kind to myself. If I screw up or if I do something that I'm embarrassed about or whatever, I just have to let it go. Also, I just try to find humor with it. Uh, I, you have to. I have this little magnet on my fridge that says, if you're having a bad day, an important thing to remember is that no one cares. <laughs> Honestly, it's so, it's so nobody true cares and if they do care they might be obsessed with you like if it's the same thing with haters no one's thinking about you as much as you think they're thinking about you and yeah. if they are they're obsessed with you and that's not Which a good is thing sad for them i feel sad yeah. for haters i'm like really oh my god yeah. i want you to find something in your life that you love so you don't have to worry about things that you hate yeah. <laughs> but, but that kind of has that mentality has kind of helped me with anxiety or anything i would have like if i ever leave a social interaction and think oh my gosh what does that person think about me i just have to let it go and be like mm, they're probably not thinking about you so it's not a big deal and it's it's point it's pointless to stress about it and then i've also had to make just some changes in my life because i am prone to getting depressed so i had to eliminate alcohol a lot like Mm. i used to drink every day Mm -hmm. and and even if it would be a glass of wine a day or just one drink i realized one time i thought about it like when was the last time i didn't have a drink a day and it would be when i was on survivor Oh, Honestly. Wow. Yeah. yeah, no. And I, and there's alcoholic tendencies that kind of run in my family. So I'm aware of it, but I would like that feeling of a buzz because then it would just kind of numb me to whatever mm-hmm. was going on. Mm-hmm. But then the problem is I would get carried away and I'd have this buzz and then I would keep going and I would be like taking shots by myself, which is like so sad, but yeah. it was a reality. So I had to finally say, okay, you can't do this one drink a day. You have to actually 
kind of quit. So I no longer drink during the week and I still allow myself to have fun on the weekends, mm -hmm. but, um, cause I don't want to completely quit. But yeah. once I, once I eliminated drinking during the week, especially by myself, mm -hmm. it made a huge difference. And so now, yeah. yeah, I'm so I mean, proud of you. Thank you. <laughs> no, and I, I'm pretty open about it with my friends or when I had that podcast, but it's a hard thing to admit that, oh yeah, I kind of depend on alcohol a lot. I mean, yes, if I have alcohol in my apartment, sometimes I'll just drink and like take shots by myself. That's terrible. Yeah. So I finally realized that about myself and I made those changes. And so I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm a lot happier ever since doing that. Amazing. Congratulations. Congratulations. No, I, I feel had to go. I, I understand totally. Like I, yeah. not alcohol, that's not my thing, but I have other things. And one of my big things is sugar and mm. carbs and I have just basically for the last five years I've just decided like I just totally like checked out from my body <laughs> and I was just like eating whatever I wanted and not taking care of myself and it all came to a head recently and I like went to the doctor and I found out like I'd gained 45 pounds oh wow yeah and you wouldn't, I, I, you wouldn't know well thank you I mean luckily I'm tall so it's very yeah. Thinly distributed. And it's not like, and, and the thing is, I mean, the good side is that, I mean, I, obviously I knew I was gaining weight and I didn't really care. I was just like, it's fine. Like I'm just getting older. My, my body's different. Like I wasn't beating myself up about it, which yeah. I, I appreciate from a like yeah. a vanity perspective. But on the other hand, it's also like, oh, but also your body is telling you like, you're not moving it enough and you're feeding it too much sugar. Like, <laughs> you know, so I, so I recently, I went to doctor, I found out I gained this weight and I was like, oh, well, that's a lot of weight. But then the real kicker for me was that I got a pre-diabetic diagnosis. Oh. And I was like, okay, well, that is not okay. Yeah. <laughs> like that we're not doing, you know? Yeah. So I then, so this was like a month and a half ago. So I had like not had any sugar since then. I'm not eating carbs. I started working out again. I've lost 16 pounds. Like I am like on a mission, but I have to be that hardcore about it. I yep. can't pass it. I can't be like, okay, I'll just cut back on my sugar. That doesn't work for me. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's amazing. You were One bite, to... I want a whole cake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's what I've learned is I have to, I mean, right now I'm actually able to moderate, no which drinking. is amazing. Yeah. Which is, yeah. I'm shocked that I'm able to do it, but I am good about no drinking during the week. I can have fun on weekends, but also I, I hired a trainer. If you can, I mean, obviously trainers are expensive, but I hired a trainer that I know because it's also accountability. So oh, knowing, totally. so knowing yeah. that I'm going to see him on Monday mm -hmm. and if I go on a binge fest and mm -hmm. I want to binge drinking whole weekend, yeah. then it's going to be terrible and terrible. he's going to know. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I, I <laughs> and you were going to suffer so bad. <laughs> I'm going to suffer so bad. And he also like, we'll do the check-ins where he does, he, some machine that can like kind of track. So that's another thing that I found like, okay, yeah, it, this is an expense. If I save money in these other areas. Yeah. Yep. So that keeps me on track too. Mm -hmm. So I feel like whatever it is, if it's that, if it's a therapist, if it's taking time for yourself, it's, if it's meditation, if it's, gotta a find, if it's a coach, the coaches of the world. <laughs> yeah, <if it's> coach, <laughs> I just think you have to find what works for you. So yeah. I'm at a, I'm in a phase where I found what works for me, but obviously it's been a quite the road to get here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm so proud of you. Thank you. And I'm excited for you because I really do see just more and more and more amazing things are happening for you and going to continue to happen. So Thank you. should we take a shot? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. I, do, I don't drink during the week. <laughs> and I know no alcohol, too much sugar. So <laughs> it's like bad now. Cause I'm like, well, I can drink tequila cause there's no sugar in tequila. <laughs> Not good. Andrea, thank you so, so much for coming on the show. For having me. And how can people stay in touch with you and follow you and keep up with all the great things you're doing? Yeah, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at, at Andrea Belke. So A-N-D-R-E-A-B-O-E-H-L-K-E. <laughs> you're so good at that. <laughs> um, and I'm going to link to your social media in the show notes. So everyone can feel free to just click and check out Andrea and make sure that you follow her and see all of her adventures on the red carpet. Next time you see The Rock, tell him I said hi, because I do. I will. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to check the show notes for links to all of Andrea's social media. And you can stay in touch with me on all social media at Dear Franny. You can follow the podcast on Instagram and Facebook at Dear Franny Podcast. And if you like what you hear, please take a moment to subscribe to the show so you don't miss any future episodes. And if you really like what you hear, please be sure to rate and review us. Thank you so very much. Have a beautiful day wherever you are in the world. Thank you for spending some of your precious time with me.